we'll be presenting on the role of mobile virtual reality in environmental education. The ethos of our research is to show how virtual reality-based field trips can support physical field trips in disciplines such as geography, science, ecology, and history, where outdoor field work is integral to the learning. My name is Shelley Minocha. Our lead author and co-presenter here is Dr. Anna Despina Tudor. We both work at UK's Open University, and we are based in the Center for Research in Computing. We are on Twitter, and our Twitter addresses will appear in the chat. We are currently involved in a Google-funded virtual reality research project, which is on a mobile virtual reality application called Google Expeditions. The chat will have the transcript of our presentation. If you would like to access the PDF file of our presentation, it is at a link which will also appear in your chat. It's in the Dropbox. If we miss any of your questions, could you kindly type them again at the end of our presentation? Before I start, I'd like to thank our conference mentor, Charlotte Bailey, who is here in the audience. Over the last two weeks, she has offered us great support in getting us ready for today. So many thanks to you, Charlotte, from me and Anna. So here we are, Anna and me in real life. And in this project, our collaborators are UK's Field Studies Council, and two subject associations, the Geographical Association and the Association for Science Education. In the presentation today, I'll outline our previous research in virtual field trips, and I'll give you an introduction to this virtual reality app called Google Expeditions. My colleague Anna then will present a case study of a geography outdoor field trip of year seven students to demonstrate how Google Expeditions can support fieldwork education. So from left to right on the slide, which is now being displayed, this slide maps out the different kinds of virtual reality, but it's also in the order in which we have conducted our research in this area over the years. We started in uh, Second Life here about a decade ago, and when we wanted a secure and a private learning space for our students at our university, we chose Unity 3D to develop a 3D virtual geology field trip and to replicate a physical field trip that our university students carry out as a part of their earth sciences or geology module. However, over the last two, three years, virtual reality has been simplifying and it is becoming accessible. So 360 degree videos can now run in Chrome browsers and you can navigate through a 360 degree space in these videos. And finally, the virtual reality apps can run on your mobile phones and can be viewed through these virtual reality viewers. And one of the mobile virtual reality educational apps that we've been investigating is the Google Expeditions app. So, and you'll also note from this slide that virtual reality is simplifying and is becoming mobile. And we call this mobile virtual reality as democratization of virtual reality as more and more people can now access it. Since today's presentation is on the role of virtual field trips in environmental education, we'll give you some context and background of our previous initiative in virtual field trips and the 3D virtual geology field trip that we developed in Unity 3D. The rationale of developing the virtual field trip is as follows. Outdoor field work is very important in geography, environmental sciences. Field work in schools and higher education is generally declining. Many students are unable to go for physical field trips. There could be mobility constraints, family constraints, or other resource constraints. These constraints could be their own or their institutions. So we were keen to develop an environment <coughs> which would be useful for both kinds of situations. Students who may not be able to go for a physical field trip and students who are able to go for a physical field trip may use the 3D environment as a space for reflection and practice. And we chose a virtual geology field trip because as a part of our Earth Sciences module, students go to the Skiddaw Mountains of the Lake District. And we used digital photogrammetry and 3D modeling 
to build this Kiddor area and this 3D environment. So as an avatar, just as we can do it in Second Life, you can move around as if you were on a physical field trip. But you can fly, you can get a perspective of the whole area, and you can view the site, which is not possible on a physical field trip. And the resolution of the rocks is so good that you can learn to sketch in this virtual environment. And as many of you would know that sketching is a key geological skill. There are six sites in this virtual field trip. And at each site, there are a set of activities that the students carry out, just as they would do it on a physical field trip. We've included a link here on this slide on the, of, of this video of this virtual geology field trip in case you are interested to know more about this Unity 3D based virtual geology field trip. It's called the Virtual Skid Dog, and this link will also appear in the chat. Next, looking at 360 degree videos in the Chrome browser. As uh, I mentioned earlier, that it's becoming simpler. And with 360-degree video cameras, you can now make 360-degree videos and watch them on a mobile phone via a virtual reality viewer, or you could view it in a Chrome browser, browser on a desktop or a laptop or on your tablet. And, you, and on a mobile phone, you can watch them through the virtual reality viewer. So it's not a flat view, but you can move from left and right, up and down within the videos to get this 360-degree view, an all-round view of the context. And these videos are normally accompanied by some audio to add detail and information to the scenes. So if you see on this slide, on the left-hand side, there is a brain surgery being recorded as a 360-degree video. And one of the many uses of such a video could be for, as an educational resource for medical students. On the right-hand side, this is a video of a 360-degree tour of some healthy corals, which are being studied as to how they are not getting bleached while the corals in Great Barrier Reef are getting bleached. And there are URLs included for these videos on the slides. And so there are many initiatives, educational, marketing, environmental campaigning, and even for fundraising that are using these 360-degree videos. So increasingly, virtual reality is being viewed through the virtual reality viewers or headsets which are either tethered to high-spec computers or are used to view virtual reality apps on mobile phones. And it's one of these mobile virtual reality apps that we are focusing in our presentation today, and which is Google Expeditions. So what does this Google Expeditions kit have? The Google Expeditions kit contains a tablet, a mobile phone, a virtual reality cardboard viewer, which is also called the Google Cardboard, a Google Expeditions app, which can be downloaded on both Android and iOS systems for free, and a router. The tablet connects to the phone through a local network, which is created by the router. Both the tablet and the phone run the same app. The tablet runs in the guide mode, and the phone is in the follower mode. So in a typical class, the educator will have the tablet, and she'll be in the guide mode, and there'll be 25 or phones so around, which each student will have a phone, and they will be running their phones in the follower mode. Now, the Google Expeditions app contains 500 expeditions, and an expedition means it's a virtual field trip to a location somewhere in the world. And all these locations are 360-degree photospheres. And the phone has to be slotted in the cardboard viewer, also called the Google Cardboard, and it's the lenses of the viewer that give the 3D effect to the photosphere. This kit was initially planned to be used in a class where the educator would run the tablet in the guide mode and the students would follow the expedition on the phones. But now it's possible to run these expeditions exclusively on the phone and there is no need for anyone to guide the scenes through a tablet. So a menu opens on the phone and inside the cardboard and one can navigate through the expeditions on their own. And this is quite effective for self-exploration or self-directed learning. The slide which, I've, which we are showing now shows some of the places uh, of, of expeditions that are there in, in this app. So there are several types of these expeditions to places where it might be possible but too expensive to go in real life, like the Great Barrier Reef or the Borneo Rainforest, or it might be impossible to see the events that matter, 
such as the coral bleaching event that occurs in summer. Other expeditions could be to dangerous areas such as Cherbonel or places that one is unlikely to visit, such as the International Space Station. So in our uh, research program on Google Expeditions, we have focused on two subjects, geography and science. And our empirical research has been in primary and secondary schools, but we've also interacted with higher education educators to investigate the role of this mobile virtual reality technology in learning and teaching. So our research program has had three key objectives. The first objective has been on inquiry that can and how Google Expedition can raise students' curiosity and support them in asking questions and developing their own research interests. As you may know that inquiry-based learning is an educational paradigm that encourages students to follow their own research interests by asking questions and then students conduct research to find the answers to those questions. And we wanted to see whether Google Expeditions or this mobile virtual reality app gives them that initial stimulation to ask questions. Does it raise their curiosity? The second topic we wanted to investigate was that how Google Expeditions can support learning through simulations of processes, phenomena and concepts that are otherwise difficult to visualize, like the process of pollination, the human anatomy or the solar system. And the third topic, which is the focus of our presentation today, we wanted to find out can Google Expeditions support fieldwork preparation, that is before you go for a physical field trip, during the physical field trip and after you've done a physical field trip, so in the post fieldwork activities. So we wanted to see whether Google Expeditions can support fieldwork education in subjects such as science and geography, where fieldwork learning is a key part of teaching and learning and the curriculum. So during our research program, we have interviewed 24 educators, six curriculum experts, 19 field workers, and we have conducted lessons with 549 students from year four to year 11 in schools across England. So during our project on Google Expeditions, we found that participants, when they were speaking to us about their experiences, that what, what helped them as far as this mobile virtual reality was concerned, the participants, both students and educators, referred to the educational affordances of this mobile virtual reality when they were describing these experiences and how their experiences were shaped by the characteristics of this mobile virtual reality. So I just list out the six key affordances that came up as a part of our doing our data analysis. The first is 360 degree visual authenticity. So the 360 degree photospheres of physical spaces in Google Expeditions, they help to capture every possible viewing direction and therefore they provide a wide, wide field of view and the size and the location of the objects with respect to one another and you almost have the sense of being there not really as you have it in Second Life, but yet the photospheres give you that, the 360 degree photospheres give you that effect of being there, along with the sense of space and the spatial relationships. The next is 360 degree navigation. While looking at the Google expeditions via the cardboard viewer, students were able to move their head left to right, up and down to see the scene all around them. And this helped them to orient themselves and to understand the characteristics of the place that they were visiting, to give them that sense of scale, to give them that understanding of the space around them. The other affordance that they mentioned was the three-dimensional view. And as I mentioned before, the lenses of the virtual reality viewer focus and reshape the images in these photospheres, in these Google expeditions for each eye, and they create this stereoscopic 3D image. And this 3D affordance is particularly relevant for visualizing and for understanding perspectives. And in geography, it can support sketching. And Anna will revisit some of these affordances when she describes the case study of how these affordances influenced the students' experiences during the field work. Now coming to the affordance of emphasis, which is on the second row on the slide being displayed. This affordance is specific to the educator, and this occurs in the guide-driven mode of Google Expeditions. So there are some predefined viewpoints identified in each of these expeditions, and the teacher can select them 
and the students then can see on their screens where the educator wants them to focus and to see. And that again helps the educator to direct where she would like students to see based on the learning outcomes of the activity or the lesson that is being conducted. Synthesis is another affordance, and this is again from an educator's perspective. So we noticed in our lessons that we conducted, the educator would sometimes use more than one Google expedition in her lesson, or she would use Google expeditions alongside videos, alongside some audio, audio uh, clips or sounds. So this is the, through combining these resources along with Google expeditions, the educators were creating a multimedia and a multimodal experience for their students. And finally, the affordance of single user handling, which is quite critical from a learner's or a student's perspective. Now, each student experiences these uh, virtual field trips or Google expeditions through the virtual reality viewer, which they hold over their eyes. And this creates that single user experience. So each student has their own individual viewing experience, then being bound by the, the video if, if it was being shown, where you only get the director's perspective or the educator's perspective of what she wants you to view. But here you have your own viewing direction and the students were able to explore from their own point of view. And the students were also not conscious of others because you hold this um, virtual reality viewer over, over your eyes and then you can't see anything else around. And that gave them a sense of immersion, a sense of control. And there is a link to our paper, which will appear in the, uh, in the chat, where we have discussed these affordances in detail and, and how uh, they play a role in teaching and learning these affordances of mobile virtual reality. Now coming to the focus of fieldwork education, and which is the focus of our presentation today. And fieldwork involves leaving the classroom and engaging in learning through first-hand experience of phenomena in outdoor settings. And exploration in natural habitats introduces students to the variety and unpredictability of the real world and increases their interest in scientific inquiry. And that is why fieldwork is so integral to learning in geography, science, environmental sciences, ecology, history. However, over the last decade, there has been a decline in field study opportunities in schools. And virtual field trips, as we have in Google Expeditions, they support the physical field trips by providing a complementary experience. And this complementary experience or this supporting experience that virtual field trips provide, it extends right from the pre-physical field trip stage, that is, before you go for an outdoor field work, or during the outdoor field work, and after you've come back from a physical field trip, as these three stages are displayed on this slide. I'll now give you three examples of how virtual field trips can support fieldwork education across these three phases. And these are three case studies from the research. So the first one, our research investigations have shown that a virtual field trip can help to familiarize students, educators, and any support staff that is going with them for the outdoor field work with the location of the intended physical field trip or outdoor field work. So a virtual field trip can help them to assess the risks, prepare them better. It can also help to raise their curiosity, help them to prepare their inquiry questions, which they will, which, which they will conduct research on during the field trip. For example, the geography educator, she mentioned about the role of the London Olympic Park expedition ahead of their outdoor field trip. And they do, it, do this as a part of the year 12 here in the UK. And she said it allowed students to plan ahead for how long it would take them to access the site and to carry out the physical measurements. So this is a kind of a preparation that you and familiarization that you can do in a virtual field trip before you go for the physical field trip. The next one is about during a field trip, how do these virtual field trips support? And here the learning outcome for this particular case study was to sensitize students on how large scale developments can impact the environment. So two educators took these students, 68 students of year seven, to their local nature reserve. And while they were outdoors, students looked at a particular Google expedition called Environmental Change in Borneo. And they saw how in Borneo, because of deforestation, construction, tourism, it had affected the natural environment in Borneo. 
And by looking at the environmental changes in Borneo in virtual reality, the students were able to reflect on how their local nature reserve would change because of the large scale development of a high speed railway route that is going to run through that area. And it is this particular case study that my colleague Anna will describe in her part of the presentation. She will elaborate of how virtual field trip helped in students learning uh, while they were on the field trip with this Google expeditions. Let me take now the third case study that is how uh, virtual field trips can support learning after an outdoor field work or after a physical field trip. So here the learning outcomes were that the students uh, wanted, the students were, uh, uh, were expected to understand the various kinds of rocks and how the different kinds of rocks are used. So depending upon the type of the rock, what kinds of applications these rocks can be put into for year four students. So first the educator introduced the rocks and fossils to them. She showed them some samples in the school. Then one day she organized a visit to the local cemetery to understand the different kinds of rocks that were used in their local church and the local cemetery. And then she ran a lesson for Google Expeditions where she showed them virtual field trips to Petra, Taj Mahal, Machu Picchu, and she also showed them Egyptian pyramids. And this showing of these virtual field, field trips facilitated extending the understanding of the rocks from a classroom for physical field trip locally and then to an international context. So students were now seeing international locations and applying their knowledge and enhancing their experience and knowledge through this Google expeditions. So now I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Anna and she will focus on a typical case study, on a specific case study on how Google expeditions were used during a physical field trip and they contributed towards environmental education of year seven geography students. So Anna, the floor is yours. I'll move the chat for you now and, and the slides for you, and you can now concentrate on your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Shaley, for the introduction and review, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, we will now present the case study of using VR in the field with a group of students who learned about environmental change in Borneo and in their local, uh, local nature reserve. So in November 2016, we went on a field trip to Presswood Nature Reserve, which is located in the Chilterns area of Southeast England, and we had a group of 64 Year 7 students. While in the field, students explored the Google Expedition Environmental Change in Borneo. The aim of this virtual trip was to help students understand the impact on nature produced by deforestation, land clearance, and development of buildings but also to sensitize them to the potential magnitude of impact on their local nature reserve that may be caused by the development of a high-speed railway nearby. So during the field trip, students came in groups of 8 to 10, to 10 to our Google expedition table that we had set up on a picnic table. And they spent about 10 minutes touring this expedition environmental change in Borneo under the guidance of the educator. If we look closer um, at the data collection, um, in the field work, while in the field, after the students saw various scenes, they were required to fill out a field worksheet and comment on how Google Expeditions made them feel differently about the nature reserve that they were visiting. After the field trip, students returned to the school and had a debriefing session of about 30 minutes. And in this session, they wrote their reflections in response to this guiding question. How did virtual reality help you to understand about the impact of large-scale developments on the Chilterns? After this debriefing session with students, we, the research team, conducted a face-to-face -face group interview with two educators who had led the physical field trip. So these are the scenes uh, that students explored in the field. The pristine rainforest is the one on the left. It describes the plant and animal diversity in Borneo. Then the next scene that they saw was land clearance and deforestation which shows how the forest is cleared and how former forest areas turn into open space. The next one is land encroachment, and it shows how land is being cut through to create space for new real estate development. And the last scene they saw was Sandankan development, which shows modern touristic coastal developments at the beach. Now, to analyze the data, we used the awareness to action continuum proposed by Barnes & College in 2013. 
This is a continuum used in environmental education to show how students can progress from being aware of an environmental issue to taking action and adopting a more geologic, ecologically responsible behavior. The awareness to action model has several stages. The first stage is awareness and appreciation, and it allows students to experience nature and its beauty. The second stage is knowledge and understanding through which students understand how natural systems work and how they are interconnected with human systems and activity. The third one is attitudes and values through which students learn about respect and concern towards the planet and feel ethically motivated to participate to environmental preservation. The fourth stage is personal responsibility and action through which moral responsibility turns into ecologically sensitive behaviors. But there's also a fifth stage that we haven't addressed, which is called problem-solving skills that students acquire to identify, analyze, and contribute to resolving environmental issues. But we left this stage aside because of the short duration of the field trip. So let's move on now to each of these stages. In our data analysis, we identified two types of awareness fostered by the experience of virtual reality in the field. The first type of awareness refers to the environmental challenges created by large-scale development in Borneo and in the local nature reserve, respectively. So by exploring the scenes in Google expeditions, such as pristine rainforest and then land clearance, students could visualize how the rainforest in Borneo had been affected by deforestation, palm oil plantations, and real estate developments. The second type of awareness refers to learning about the characteristics of the places in virtual reality and of the one that they were visiting as part of their field trip. So one student said, it helped me to understand because I saw a beautiful jungle full of green and life. Then in virtual form, we saw building sites, sparse trees. If that happened to the Chilterns with the high speed two rail, it would be devastating. Further, we wanted to understand how virtual reality supported students in their awareness and appreciation. And we were able to identify the role of VR by looking at their activity sheets in the field, where they wrote down their experience of Google Expeditions. These are some of the affordances that contributed to students' awareness and that Shaley has already mentioned. Through 360-degree visual authenticity and synthesis, Students were able to see a faraway place and access various perspectives through several scenes within the same expedition. And one student said, it helped us understand as it showed us lovely, beautiful forest that was untouched by humans. Then it showed us a picture of a barren, ugly place where trees had been chopped down. Through the affordance of emphasis, while still free to explore the photosphere alone, students were guided by their educator to look at relevant points and focus on specific content. One student commented, I found it fun and a new way of learning. It was helpful that they gave you an arrow to show what you were looking for. The next stage of the continuum is knowledge and understanding. Through their comments, students demonstrated that they acquired knowledge and understanding of the issues that come along with large-scale developments and their impact. One student said, it helped me understand because it gave me an idea of how big the impact was and the large scale of the setting. It also helped me because some things in the setting were not seen in everyday life, such as higher rainforest trees. Further, virtual reality helped students understand the geographical concept of scale. This was supported by the affordance of 360 visual authenticity, 360 degree navigation, and 3D view, which gave them the bird's eye view over the rainforest. So a student said, it showed me all different things and how things like high speed rail too can really impact. You could see it on a large scale, so you got to see things on an overall scale. The educator commented that virtual reality enables students to compare and contrast their local nature reserve to Borneo rainforests, which is another important geographical skill. She said, it is that taking the local into global or the global into local. The possibility to actually visualize the impact of development on nature is an experience that would be difficult to acquire without a comparison of places. Using virtual reality while in the field gave students a unique experience that educators found very useful for their actual understanding of the issue. A student said, one stage would be, yes, we've done the fieldwork. 
we've been to see this is the area that would be destroyed perhaps if something big like that was to happen through it. And then secondly, when you look at that, yeah, that could be pretty horrible. But then to see Borneo and see actually it really would be pretty horrible, it all makes it make sense again. Students also inferred the broader impact on ecosystems and predicted the change brought by human intervention through their comments on the effects of flora and fauna that live in their local nature reserve and how the construction of the railway would affect biodiversity, tourism and living standards of local. One student said, it made me understand that there would be a big change in the Chilterns and not necessarily a good change. Also, it will ruin for it for the life, wildlife and animals which help the Chilterns grow and expand. I hope the Chilterns won't change. The next stage of the continuum is attitudes and values. The attitude of values uh, of students towards the environmental change depicted in the Google expedition was expressed in negative statements. So they described the environmental impact as being worse than they had expected and devastating for the health of the rainforest. A student said, it made it easier to actually get a view on what tragedies might happen in the future. I always thought that people were being dramatic, but now I understand the long-term impact it will have on the world and the woods. The affordances of Google Expedition, such as 360-degree visual authenticity, 360-degree navigation and 3D, allowed students to see more of the rainforest as well as understand the degree of impact. And one student said, when you look through it, you can see much more than you could in a normal picture. Also, as you can see 360 degrees around it, make it a lot clearer and see the big impact on the environment closer up. The last stage of the continuum we refer to is personal responsibility and action. Several students acknowledge here that there is a shared responsibility for protecting nature and that there is a need for action to prevent the destruction of nature reserve. And one student said, we all have to share our part of helping in the world. Another commented, we need to try and stop destroying the wildlife and to do something about it. The final outcome of the field trip and of the virtual reality experience via Google Expeditions was to support students in writing a letter to the Chiltern Society to address their concerns about the development of the High Speed 2 in the Chiltern's area where the Prestwood Nature Reserve is located. And following the field work, students composed the letter and then the most relevant ones were passed on to the Chiltern Society. So in this direction, Google Expeditions helped them create a context for their story and understand that large-scale developments are happening all over the world with irreversible consequences. The experience gave them arguments to oppose the construction of high-speed rail through their nature reserve. To wrap up, there are three key points from our case study. The first one refers to experiential learning. Experiential learning is one of the most important outcomes of fieldwork. And with the help of virtual reality, students experienced a different location than the one that they visited and felt as if they were actually there in Borneo. They could look around and discover for themselves in VR the characteristics of the rainforest and explore through various scenes the way it has changed due to human intervention. So this is an important finding because it allows educators to use VR effectively as tool to give students a similar experience of a physical field trip by using virtual reality. Spatial learning. Through the affordances of 360-degree visualization, navigation, and 3D, students were able to explore and understand how large the rainforest is and how much large-scale developments affect it. They acquired a good understanding of two very important spatial components in geography, geography education, such as scale and spatial-temporal change. That is, how nature reserves change over time through human intervention. And the last key point, global to local. So students were able to visit a faraway place, compare and contrast an international location with their local nature reserve, and infer what could happen to their local reserve if the high-speed rail 2 were to be built nearby. I will pass it on now to Shaley, who will share some of our reflections. Thank you very much, Anna. So the case study that Anna has presented has shown us two things. First of all, how the affordances of Google Expeditions supported the different kinds of learning in fieldwork education. And the general concern people have about virtual field trips replacing physical field trips may not be true. 
As in this case study, the virtual field trip enhanced the outdoor field work experienced and in fact reinforced the environment education. So this is one of the conclusions about the field work education as far as our work and presentation is concerned. The focus in this research study was on geography. However, other subjects with a tradition in field work such as ecology, biology and environmental sciences could also benefit from including virtual reality in field work education. Now coming on to the role of educator. Educators could use virtual field trips to complement outdoor field work. And as we've seen in every case study and in our own experiences, when Anna and I have gone to various schools, it's, it's not the technology, but it's the role of the educator, which is paramount. They design the activities when using Google expeditions that fit with the curriculum and deliver the learning outcomes. So it's not the technology, but how they design activities around it and make it effective for their students. However, for the success of Google Expeditions or for any initiatives that involve technologies in teaching and learning, it is important that educators are given opportunities for continuing professional development to enhance their confidence and skills to such an extent that they can actively take decisions in introducing technologies in their curriculum and use them effectively. So this last slide of our presentation has our uh, project website address and we have we keep an active blog in case you'd like to have a look at our blog posts. Our email addresses uh, and a link to the web page that has our publications is also on this slide. And this presentation that we have at this conference is based on a paper which has been accepted for Journal of Virtual Studies and it will be online within about a month's time. So, and, and the link is also appearing in the chat here. So thank you very much and uh, we are very grateful for your kind attention and we are ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for Mana and me for your, for your attention and for your um, for your applause. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dai, we have not moved into Rift and Vive so far. We know about it and Anna has had, has had more experience than I have had with Rift and Vive, but uh, we have been very busy this last one and a half years with this particular work that we've been doing with schools and with Google Expeditions. I remember that when Google funded this project for Google Expeditions, I thought that we had taken some steps back because we, I felt ha after having worked in Second Life for such a long time and then developed something in Unity 3D, and here I was moving to 360 degree photospheres. But for the schools, I think that it worked very well because uh, of the simplicity of the technology. They didn't need very high spec um, computers. They didn't need very high speed networks, it just worked well for them. So I think for schools, this was an ideal situation. Uh, can I pick uh, Beth's question? How do you encourage students to develop good questions? Uh, Beth, it's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, teachers play a major role in encouraging students to do that. And we came across several tools that they use, such, such as the uh, five W's, which is a grid of questions that uh, start from the very basic what is happening there to what could happen on what are the consequences of an event. Um, but what we discovered with Google Expeditions is that actually students become very creative once they get to explore the scenes and once they are let um, alone to look for themselves where they want to look, they come up with various questions and some of them become really predictive and very interesting questions, deep questions or high order questions as we like to call them. So I believe that Google Expeditions is really supportive in that sense and as long as the teacher guides them through the scenes and guides their attention, they progress from asking really simple questions to thinking deeper. 
uh, to re in regards to what they see there. Anna, Shambhal Guru has a question. If you look in the chat, it has been posted by by Leo Lobo and it says about the student feedback, comments and answers. Are these done on paper or digitally? Are they shared with other students? Um, Shambhal, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, Anna will add to this, but our uh, entire work with uh, students was done on paper because it was, uh, they were doing these activities in the classroom. Uh, and it was a very, uh, it was very much an educator driven um, scenario. So we didn't interfere, we were just observers there. And we let the teacher run it as she normally does, which is on paper. Uh, but what we did was, as Anna was explaining earlier to in, in, with, in, uh, in reply to Beth's question, uh, we didn't evaluate the questions ourselves because, first of all, we are not geographers or scientists. And secondly, we don't know much about the students' background and what their level of knowledge or, or expertise is. So the teachers evaluated the questions on our behalf and they were able to comment on how the questions were different from what they would normally have written. And that is how we came to know that the students were much were working into that higher order questions and more analytical and uh, evaluative questions and predictive questions as Anna was saying. So I hope I've answered your question, Shambles. Otherwise, please do ask. Anna, did you want to add anything to Shambles' uh, question, please? Um, yes, just a small um, note that when we did research with another group of students, uh, the teacher allowed them to have a small group discussion before their comments and before the class activities that they had to fill out as part of our research. So in that setup, they were allowed to look at one another's paper and to work a bit collaboratively, but we didn't create this as a separate uh, setup for our research. That was just the case in that one particular study. Here, although in this uh, case study, students sat at the same table and while they were filling out the sheets, uh, they were talking to one another. So. Um, there was an exchange of idea, but we didn't uh, analyze that in particular. So we don't know exactly how ideas were bounced from one student to another. Thank you, Anna. Uh, there is another question uh, where we have where we being asked about what are the anticipated benefits of development? Should the students be given information on those as well so that they can understand the controversies involved? Um, um, I think that that, that happened uh, in a previous lesson to our uh, Google Expeditions field trip. So this field trip was part of a larger lesson on environmental change. And I think that students knew already about or had discussed already about the benefits of development. Um, because I think the teacher mentioned that, that they knew what would be the, benef the economic benefits and in t t t terms of saving time as well for commuters. So they had that knowledge, but in Google Expeditions, uh, in that particular Google Expedition, um, the focus was not on the benefits. It was more on how the environment is impacted by large-scale developments and on the negative side. Uh, Shaylee, maybe you are able to answer Day's question about the geology and paleontology field trips. Yes, uh, uh, I don't think, Anna, we have geology and paleontology field trips in Google Expeditions. Uh, they are very much uh, simpler. Or do, you, do you know if there are any, Anna? I remember one on the history of Earth, and there is one um, on the formation of planets. So there might be there about the history, the, the geological history of Earth, but about paleontology, not really. They keep adding expeditions. So last time I checked, which was a week ago, I think there were over 700. Uh, 50, so 750, and I think they keep adding them, so maybe paleontology will also become a topic. Dave, what we can do is to send you a URL, uh, which is a, a URL to a Google Docs, where they keep uh, the the full list of all the expeditions, and they also give some, um, some basic idea of what that expedition has. So we will send you that Google Docs document. Uh, so that you can have a look and it's it's searchable so you'll be able to find out if there is specific thing of your interest
they we have not uh, considered students making uh, virtual field trips in Unity 3D. We haven't done it so far. I think it's the nature of the students that we have been working with. Unlike not working with computer science students, we've been working with geologists and geographers. And in that case, we have provided them with virtual field trips. And, and they have interacted with it as a part of their uh, activities and curriculum. And therefore, we haven't encouraged that as yet. Anna, there was a question that Charlotte had sent to us. Would you like to have a look at that? Um, I'll have a look at that just a moment. Is it a higher? It's in, in the chat. Yes, in the chat that we have with Charlotte. And I'll have a look at the local chat. There is another question by Shambles Guru. He says, the use of Google Cardboard, are the students using their own mobile phones? Were they provided for free, etc.? Oh, Shambles. We were very fortunate. We were given the kit by Google. So we were given 32 phones, we were given five tablets, and we were given over 50 Google Cardboards, Cardboard viewers. So we were extremely lucky to have this equipment, and we took this equipment to the various schools that we went to. And but some of the schools, there was one school who have now influenced, not only by us, because they had, uh, they had a trip by Google as well, uh, they have now bought the entire kit and they, they are sharing across the various years and across the various subjects. So we know at least of one school which has bought it. The other school, they had the iPads and they didn't have the phones. So what they have done is that they uh, we ran a lesson with them that the Google Expeditions ran on the iPad and they found that that experience was not as effective as with the virtual reality viewers and phones but they felt that at least they could introduce different locations and different field trips to the students through the iPads. So they are using iPads. Other schools have decided to get, their, get the parents send some phones to them so that they can develop their own kit uh, of, of uh, phones. Getting cardboards is not expensive. I think the main cost is of the phones. And students are using expeditions at home. There is some evidence of it, although we did not interview students or ask students about it. But uh, there are some uh, teachers in one of the schools who are encouraging students. And Anna, here I mean the Ely School, where we know about uh, one of the educators being very creative, and he's encouraging them to explore these expeditions. Yes. All right. yes. uh, so, uh, Anna, did you want to add anything about the costs and about uh, about the cardboard and so on, the phone availability? Did you want to say anything? Um, I wanted to say something about the option to explore on your own, which is very uh, is the, the whole experience is very nice. So you can explore all the expeditions on your own. You don't necessarily need a tablet in the self guiding mode and. Um, there is it is the same amount of information that you would get otherwise with the teacher walking you through the expedition so what they did is they took the text from the tablet which usually is accessible only for the teacher and they moved it on the mobile phone so you as a student can read the same amount of text and explore the expedition on your own and um, the interface is very easy to to work with and i tried it several times and it's 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 fun and it's easy so i think that if students have access to smartphones, they can definitely explore on their own at home or on parents' mobile phones, because I think that expedition run, runs now on, on several generations of mobile phones. Hello, Shambles and others. Does, does it answer your question about the costs? Uh, uh, sorry, the brain, the brain surgery one is not as a part of uh, Google Expeditions. I was giving that example as a part of a 360-degree uh, video uh, which, which runs in the Chrome browser. And you will find that link in our presentation shambles. It is in the, uh, it's, uh, I had given a URL in that slide. But that URL is also, I think, uh, it's available in that PDF that we gave um, in that, um, Anna. Would you be able to give that Dropbox link here from our um, from our um, sure, from I'll our chat? Sure, sure. I'll, have have and I'll, I'll send it a sep I'll send it again. Yeah, if you can put that Dropbox link, which has our presentation, so that Shambles can look at the URLs in that. Thank yes. you very much. Yes. 
but this was our first experience of working with schools, both for Anna and me. And I think we have been really surprised and humbled by the creativity of the teachers, that how teachers with, in very difficult circumstances, with very little resources, do a lot for their students, and how creatively they build these activities around the, around the expeditions. Um, and we gave them very minimal training. Most of the time, we were only showing, discussing with them over the phone. Because if they were not, uh, uh, they were not, the schools were not in our locality, and we, if we had to travel to them, we were training them over the phone, and uh, or by giving them instructions over the email. They chose the, um, uh, they chose the expeditions themselves. They chose the learning activities themselves. And um, so we were merely as observers or just being there to help with the technology if something went wrong. And one of the schools that really um, we found was very effective in terms of managing technology was they have a concept of digital leaders. So they have, this is the school with the iPads. And this, the, the, the educator doesn't really have to do much about it. She has these students who work as digital leaders and they look after the iPads, they charge the iPads, they keep them up to date, and therefore the lot of the workload gets transferred on to the students, but in a way students are learning a lot. They are developing digital skills which will serve them well when they go out of the school. So, um, if we have missed answering any question or if you have any thoughts Yes, uh, you're absolutely right, the shambles. Uh, even in the UK, many schools don't allow their students to have their own phones in the school. And um, they are also, we are also hoping that these policies will change, that uh, students would be allowed to use their own phones because it's not just the Google Expeditions app, but there are various mobile educational apps now which could serve the students well if, if they were allowed to do that. So it's, 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 I think this, this problem is, is in other places as well, or this particular policy is everywhere as well. But yes, the app is free, and that gives a lot of flexibility for students to look at things. Yes, Aleti, you are right. As a resource also, all the educators have said that even if they don't use Google Expeditions in the virtual reality mode, uh, it, about having this 700 over 700 expeditions is a very useful resource. It, 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 it's right from Antarctica, Iceland, places that people may not be able to visit. Um, if, and it has lots of international resources. So it's not only the UK and the Europe, but it has various US resources, European, uh, your, uh, Australian resources. It has lots of museums. And uh, whenever there is any particular anniversary, like if it's the World War One or the World War II, uh, then the then Google gets together these various expeditions together and sends out them on Twitter so that teachers could relate whatever the occasion is with the expeditions usage in the class. Anna, sorry, you wanted to add something to this student? Um, no, no, Shelly, I think you covered it nicely. And I think that that answers the question about the one-to-one -one laptop so, as well. Um, so that students can use VR on, uh, sorry, not on laptops, on, on um, tablets, I meant. So on the laptop, it, not Google Expeditions, but then other 360 degree videos can be used definitely to explore 360 degree. But of course, it wouldn't be the same experience. Yes, that's right about uh, about these the cell phones and how they could be distracted. There is one school that we know that they don't allow us. They don't allow their uh, students to use uh, to take photos within the school, and so they may be able to use their phones, but they're not allowed to take photos within the school. Uh, but uh, we haven't come across any school uh, so far. Who are uh, who have allowed their students to bring their own phones and use them in these kinds of educational ways?
if there is any way we could help in sharing our experiences of working with schools, conducting research with schools, the ethical considerations that we had to follow, how we build up trust with these schools. And we are now publishing with our, with our teachers, uh, the teachers who worked with us. So please do get in touch with us and we would be happy to share our experiences. In fact, the paper from this particular presentation uh, has one of the teachers on board uh, as, an, as a co-author. Uh, because we were, uh, she became very interested in how we were conducting research, and therefore we involved her in this in this process. So I think it is it is important to have educators as co-researchers as well, because you are able to build the trust, and then you we are also able to give them those skills of conducting research. So today it's legal expeditions, but tomorrow if they take up any other technology for um, uh, as a part of their learning and teaching initiatives, they would know how to investigate its effectiveness in an economical, small-scale manner. So I think uh, Anna and I were very uh, open to sharing how we were conducting the research, how we were analyzing the data, whenever any educator expressed interest in our process. So um, I hope that uh, if these experiences uh, will help them. and. They helped us too because they became co-researchers, so we got a lot of their information and a lot of uh, inputs from them and a lot of insights about how students learn from them. Anna, did you want to add any? Anna, did you want to add anything as a last point? Because we have two minutes left now. Um, I would like to thank everyone. I think for the good questions so far, and uh, yes, like you said, feel free to contact us if you have any questions or if you require any support with using Google Expeditions in Classroom or any best practices on um, on the uh, project page. Um, have we shared, Shaley, our project page? Um, I wanted to say that there there is a... Um, I know that our page is on this website. Yes, it, it's on, at the website, yes. So on the project page, um, we have posts of uh, how to use it in the classroom, so best practices, and maybe they can be of help. Thank you very much for from both Anna and me uh, for all your uh, uh, attention and for your questions. And we thank you very much, and we thank Shant Charlotte again for uh, her support as a mentor to us. And thank you, Chantal, as well from the Science Circle for representing the Science Circle here today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Bye.